So my name is Mark Brown. I'm the founder and CEO of Vita. Uh, I'm Canadian. I lived in the UK for years, about 18 years. And then now I live in Stockholm, Sweden. How we listen live, the knowledge to move your, your, your music forward. So the layout is as follows, or the agenda. I'm going to talk a bit, and then we're going to talk to Hugh. So what I'm going to talk about is I'm just going to tell people what Beat is. So we're going to be doing these every month. So you should probably know a bit about who we are and who I am. Then I'm going to talk about how we listen so everybody understands just sort of where we're coming from. And then I'm also going to talk about what we call the artist's journey. I've written a series of blog posts that sort of explain what we think are some of the key things that artists need to think about or people just starting in the music business. So just to give you a bit of background on what I've done in and around music, uh, I dropped out of university back in the 90s and I started working at this small artist run record label called Murder Records. It was run by this band Sloan from Halifax. And this was in the mid 90s and back then there was no digital and you know, it was still pretty hard to start a record label, hard to get distribution. Um, and I did that for a handful of years. I toured with a lot of bands all around North America. Then end of the 90s, I moved to the UK and I worked at this label called Creation. Maybe some of you heard, have heard about the movie that's come out recently, Creation Stories. I think that's what it's called. Uh, and I worked in the A&R department there. And then I did that for about a year. And then the guy who started the company, Alan McGee, he started a new label called Pop Tones. And that's where I sort of got my first taste of being a radio plugger. And a radio plugger is naturally someone who is paid to go into radio stations and try to convince them to play artists' records on the radio. And that went pretty well. <clears throat> I worked with a couple bigger bands. The first big band I worked with was this Swedish band called The Hives. And so after that, I started my own boutique radio plug-in company. I worked with tons of different bands from all over the UK and the US and Canada. And I did that for about 14 years. Then sort of towards the end of the, my time in the UK, I figured out like, you know, we were moving from that transition from where you'd send in a CD to someone in a, in a jiffy bag in an envelope to sending links around. And I realized the way people send links around wasn't actually that uh, good. So we decided to start Beta. And we did this three people in the UK, in London, and we never had an office. So this is long before COVID. Um, and then one of us, Jen, my co-founder, she moved to Australia. And I thought, this is it. Our company's never going to work. She's abandoned us. And it was completely wrong. It was very easy to work together, uh, long distance. So I thought, just right after Brexit, I thought, well, if she can move to Melbourne, I'm going to move to Stockholm. So now I live in Stockholm, Sweden. So what is Beta? Beta is the platform enabling everyone to send and receive digital audio in a clean, simple, and secure way, built for everyone working with music today. Why is Beta different? And this will come into, uh, will explain a lot of what we sort of, our areas of expertise are when it comes to the knowledge part. So Beta takes advantage of audiophile's unique properties, embedded file metadata, all the information that lives in your MP3 and WAV files. Um, we allow conversion of file formats, so you upload in a lossless format, share in a lossy format like MP3. And we focus on clean, fast streaming, yet um, not rippable either. But our ultimate mission our mission statement is to provide artists and their teams with the tools and the knowledge to move their careers forward. So how do we do that? Beta is a tool, a platform for sending and receiving digital audio, of course. But then we have this whole other nonprofit sister company called How We Listen. And that's the knowledge. And that's what today's about. So a couple of years ago, um, we were sitting around talking, there, everybody on this call, Colin, who lives in Montreal, who we work with, and Jamie, who lives in Southampton, who's driving the Zoom. 
we were talking and we were getting frustrated by the fact that when, you know, especially as new artists or new people working in the music business, they, they sort of, you hear a lot of them say, oh, well, I, you know, I read that you need to get on a playlist or you just put your music up on Spotify and everything's going to go great. And unfortunately, it's not really, or maybe fortunately, actually, it doesn't really work like that. And we became frustrated that newer people coming into the music ecosystem didn't really get the information they needed to make good choices about how to move their careers forward. So that's why we started this weekly interview series where we interview people about how they find, listen, and experience new music. So I'm gonna go through a couple of the posts just to give everybody an idea of the context around how we listen. And so this quote is from a woman named Amber Horsberg. If you wanna Google her, she runs a, um, she, she does courses now, I think, and she runs this thing, this newsletter called Deep Cuts. And so she says here, you're, you're looking at basically a spreadsheet of words that plays music, no branding, no imaging, no story. It is impossible to get a hook on any artist if you do not immediately connect with the first 30 seconds of their track, it's boring. So Amber here is talking about Spotify. And she goes back to that point we, I was just talking about that you put your music on Spotify or on Apple Music or on Deezer. And that's only the first step. You need to spend a lot of time and effort building a context around who you are. And that could be you as an artist or you as a manager working with a new artist or you working in a record label. So here's another interview we did with Sherry Hu. Again, I suggest that you, um, that you Google her name. She runs this thing called Water and Music. She's a super, super smart lady. I've met her before. And this quote I think is uh, really interesting. What she's doing here is she's actually talking about tech platforms, but I think it applies perfectly to music. In general, context is difficult to automate. It requires a lot of manual human creative thinking and introspection, which is why most tech platforms that try to automate strategy end up failing at that task. So again, what she's saying is, well, startups, they can't sort of not cheat their way forward, but they can't, there's no fast track from A to B. And I think it's the same for artists that yeah, things will go well, certain things will have more of an impact, but you're really initially struggling step by step to do things by talking to people and making contact yourselves, yeah? And then this one is sort of related more to, um, to what we were talking about, all the file formats and um, metadata and streaming that we talked about. So Kyle runs a, uh, the Four Wheel Music Group in Halifax in Canada. Unreleased music is sent via platforms, Dropbox, SoundCloud, and random files that are usually aren't properly, there we have it, meta tagged, a pain, but somehow less annoying than Dropbox. So he doesn't like Dropbox, but anyway, the key thing he's saying here is, is about the meta tags. And this woman who's great, Clotilde Bale, she did, uh, we did a How We Listen panel a couple of years ago in Canada, and she works at 4AD in London in the UK. And she talks about how she has to listen to a lot of music, like we're going to be talking about with Hugh. And she gets all these files and they're mislabeled and they're missing the information she needs. So what she's saying is, you know, she can't remember who these people are or, um, or what the name of the bands are all the time. So it's super important to think about tagging your music, which we can talk about in another uh, episode of this. So to summarize, How We Listen really wants to push back against this idea that algorithms are gonna solve all your problems. And then also this other idea that you're gonna get on the top of, you'll be on a playlist um, and that's just gonna solve all your problems. And, you know, it'd be great if you got to the top of rap caviar, which I still think is probably Spotify's biggest playlist, but it's not the only thing you need. There's so much more you need. So what is how we listen live? It's basically taking these questions, these discussions and bringing it here on Zoom so everybody can talk and listen and get to know each other. So as I said, it's a monthly series. The format is gonna be the same every time. I do a little talk at the start 
I talk about some different stuff every time. And then we interview someone about a certain part of the mu music ecosystem that they know best. So today it's Hugh. He's going to be talking about he, how he discovers music, how he works um, finding new bands living in Cardiff, Wales. And so why are we doing it? Basically because we want to combat all the, that false information. We don't want people to go down the wrong path. We want to make it easy for them to learn themselves. We're all very, in our company, very big on DIY. Um, not DIY, not DIY, sorry. <laughs> And then I wanted to say no one's getting paid to do this. Um, you might all want might want to screenshot this. Instead, we're going to give a little money to Maytree, which is an organization that supports uh, people who are having suicidal thoughts. It's in London. Uh, it's super special to me. So um, take a screenshot, send them some money if you have any. Otherwise, just keep it in mind if there's anybody you know who need, needs help. Okay. So I'm going to quickly talk about these <clears throat> blog posts that Colin, who I work with, told me I should write. And I sort of, I enjoyed writing them, but it's only been recently that I think we've started to realize that a lot of the things I've written about actually are quite important for a lot of new artists. And there's a lot of good things to think about for uh, even people who've worked in music for ages. So Viznomics is my old gamer tag from back when I played video games years ago. Um, and so I write them under that name. And the first one uh, that I wrote last year, it talked about this idea of here and there, because I've done a couple talks at some schools and I've realized that, you know, a lot of artists or uh, even people trying to work in music, I think they, they see other people and then they think, oh, okay, well, that's the level of success I'm looking for. And I've come to realize that when people make music or they do certain jobs or they work in certain parts of the music industry that everybody needs to define for themselves what they wanna do, what success means to them. And I think it's super important for newer people to think of it that way, that you're in a certain place now and you're trying to get somewhere else but that somewhere else is going to be different for everyone everybody has different ambitions everybody has different views of success and so some of the big points that we figured out that it's important to mention is this idea that as an artist like there's not going to be this big big button you're going to push and i i keep joking all the time that I don't know why the button is red, but in my idea, the button that there it doesn't exist is red. And there's no gonna be no big button you're gonna press and suddenly everything is gonna go great. And um, with that in mind, you've got to really figure out like, you know, what you can do yourself, like learning to take the steps as an artist to get things going with press or touring or online or getting played on the radio. Like a lot of that, you know, especially when we talk to Hugh, there's a lot of that you can do yourself way more than you think you can. And it's good to have confidence that you can do it yourself. But then as you start to do all these things, as you're trying to figure out where this, their place is, you need to start to also think like, okay, well, I'm not really good at this. I can do it for now, but who would I need on my team? So David Newgarden, who I was talking to, he's a manager in New York. So sometimes maybe people think, okay, I don't want to deal with all these things myself. I'm going to look to find someone to help me, such as a manager, or I'm not good at finding press. I need to hire someone. But you don't necessarily need to do that right away. But it's important to think what you're good at and what you're not good at. And so again, no rush. Timing is everything. You can't really force a lot of this stuff, for better or for worse. But I also think the most important thing we talk about is don't waste money too early. We were joking that don't waste money until there's someone else's money to waste, like a label. But even then, not, that's not a good thing. You really want to be thinking about taking the best steps to avoid just, say, worrying that you're going to miss out on something and paying a lot of money for something you just don't need. And that happens a lot. So it's happened to everyone. Then what, the second post I wrote, or maybe the third, was this one. And I think this is going to come into play when we talk to Hugh. Because what I think is super different about 
the music ecosystem versus maybe other businesses is that it's very decentralized. So there are artists and there are managers and there are booking agents and there are all these different people working, interacting to make artists and bands and musician, uh, musicians successful, but you don't really know who's in charge. And I think ultimately the artist is the most important, but this is a, a map I did a couple years ago. It's a bit old, so let's zoom in and take a look at that. So this is the, U, this is the UK. And if you look up in the top left-hand corner here, there's the artist or the, or the band, and there's the manager. And then my job when I worked in radio was here. And then Hugh, he did stuff here, but then he also did stuff over in TV somewhere here. Um, and then he DJ, so he did stuff here. But when you think about it, like this is very natural to people who've worked in music for ages. As newer people coming into the music ecosystem, newer artists, I think this is very overwhelming. But at the same time, I think what's important to look at when you think about this is like, there are loads of ways to start. And so our advice is back to this question of music discovery. Like how do people like other artists that you know that you like, or say if you're managing a band or an artist, other musicians who have sort of sound the same or have had success, like how have they done it using this web of options and opportunities really? And so what would work for you? Like certain artists, if you make, uh, I was saying earlier, like if, you, if, you, if you're a metal band, chances are you're not gonna get too many syncs. I don't really understand syncs anyway. It's a bit of a dark art, but at the same time, you need to be realistic about the music you make might not be right for certain aspects, yeah? So again, many options, many paths to success. There's loads of different things you can do just because one of these routes doesn't work doesn't mean you can't go another way. You've got to be relentless in trying new things. And then lastly, the big thing to think about is you got, you got to craft your pitch when you're talking to people um, and you, got to, you have to do research. Just like when you think about how do people find music in your genre, other artists, look around, talk to people. You don't necessarily need to hire someone all the time. You can talk to other people, your peers, find your friends. If your friends or other artists are in bands and they have a manager, talk to them. There's loads of ways to figure out how this map works without just doing it by yourself. Trust me, people are always willing to help. And then, so the last one is, uh, when was this? Yeah, like six months ago. And what, what happened was, um, this here is from, a, it's an image from an old tour book, the way people used to book gigs. So you just have to write it in on a document on a calendar. Um, I was, or we, there was a conference, a music tech conference. And we noticed there were all these great people speaking. And then we also got this email about sponsorship. And in, in that email, it said that if you sponsored the event or did advertising, that you get to speak at the event. And I think we all found that pretty weird because you were basically paying to talk about your views, right? where our music's being used or you and know, so um what was really weird about that was it reminded me of when i started in halifax booking tours and every time i go to book a tour using a calendar exactly like you see here and every time i call a club in montreal in canada they'd be like oh yeah like you can play here but it costs 250 bucks and that's called pay to play where you're paying money to play a gig. And I remember even back then, how many years ago that is, I'm like, this is the weirdest thing ever. Like the artist is coming in town. Why would we want to pay to play a gig? And so we think it's super important. This is what the quote I wrote in the, in the, in the article. As an artist, the value of your art or ideas needs to be assessed objectively in order to be taken seriously. So basically, our view is, and certainly myself, is like, you know, you want people to like you for who you are and the music you make. And if your music is good, people will pay attention. You don't have to pay to get opportunities. So, and I think this comes up 
no matter how old you are or what part of the music business you work in or what you do, there's always things that come up. You think, oh, do I need to take this opportunity? And a lot of the time is, if it feels wrong, don't, don't do it, especially for newer artists. And most things don't require money at the start. There's loads of people who want to help each other and work together. And I think, you know, you just got to remember that in the back of your mind. So that's that. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. You can throw them in the chat. So Hugh, where are you? Hello, can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. You're down below. How's it going? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, welcome to Cardiff. Welcome to Club Iverbach. Oh, thanks. This is super, this is super cool. So um, we've you got, you've got a couple partners from Cardiff, yeah. from Wales. Yeah. And do you, where's, and so do you want to tell me about them? There's two of them. Yeah, well, when you asked if I would do this, um, I jumped at the chance. I've been working in radio for 20 odd years and promoting and labels and things like that. And uh, you said, let's do it from Cardiff, from Wales in the UK, where I live. Uh, who do you want to partner with? So instantly I thought of this venue, Club Iverbach. So we'll hear from Kat from the venue in a bit. The venue will be 40 years old in uh, two years time. And wow. Focus Wales is a festival that has been going um, for a long time in North Wales, in Wrexham, uh, but also taking artists from Wales to other events and festivals and conferences around the world. So I thought Andy from Focus Wales would be, uh, well, Focus Wales' perfect partner, really, because this is a worldwide event as well. Um, so do you want me to introduce Andy, Mark? Yeah, please do. Please do. Okay, so uh, Andy is here. So um, do you want to take it away, Andy? Tell us a little bit about the history of Focus Wales and what's your mission statement? Hi, everyone. Yes. Um, so I'm Andy Jones. And I'm, yeah, I'm one of the co-founders of Focus Wales. Um, as you said, we're a showcase festival that happens in North Wales in a town called Wrexham, very much like the south by southwest i guess in wales with a conference element as well as lots of shows happening across lots of different venues around the town at night we've been going about well this year should have been our 11th year but the pandemic and whatnot um we're hopeful that october we can deliver a physical event um but the event itself um as i said it involves a conference in in the daytime across the three days of the event tracks about 500 delegates these days um, from across the globe. And of an evening, we've got, yeah, up to, we're close to 300 artists performing across 20 stages, about 15,000 people. Of those artists, around 90 of them are from outside of the UK. So very much a, a focus on new artists. But then I guess a bit similar to South By, we also have some, um, better known artists, let's say, that widen the net and bring in new audiences. So, you know, um, we've got some really, well, we're announcing some artists tomorrow morning, actually, but we've got some names in there that you might be familiar with, but um, probably easier just to go to focuswales.com and have a, have a bit of a scout around, you know, who we've got announced so far. Is that is that pretty much a decent summary for this? It's brilliant. And uh, yeah, head to the website and there's questions coming in for you um, that I'm sure uh, Andy would be more than happy to answer. Like are the slots all filled? I've been to Focus Wales and it's brilliant. And it's one of these, it's a real festival, you know, that Andy and Neil and everyone who works at the festival work really hard and believe in all the artists. They're into people and they're into communications and communicating with people around the world. Um, and it's in an interesting part of Wales. We're in the capital. I'm in Cardiff right now, but Focus Wales is in Wrexham, which, um, well, it was in the headlines recently, wasn't it, Andy? It's made yeah. news because of uh, your football club. Yeah, so Ryan Reynolds has just bought the football club. So Deadpool is a red is the slogan for our local football club. Um, <laughs> but also they're producing one of the vaccines in the town as well. So we've had, to, we've had a couple of good news stories in, in the last 12 months um, in the town. But yeah, you know, as you says, it's um, we're about three and a half hours drive north of Cardiff in Wrexham. You're closer um, to Manchester, aren't you, really, than Cardiff? Exactly, yeah. So a lot of our international delegates and artists will fly into Manchester um, a lot of the time and connect from there, because that's about an hour from where we are based. But um, answering a couple of the questions that people have in terms of applications, yeah, I mean, a lot of 
our programme has rolled over from what would have been our, our 10th edition in 2020. Um, however, we're open to open our applications for 2022 from July. So if people go on our website, um, subscribe to our mailing list and um, we can keep people updated or just follow us on our socials, you know, on, on Facebook and Insta and Twitter and whatnot. Uh, thank you very much for partnership, uh, partnering with us for uh, today as well, Andy, and thanks for the uh, brief on Focus Wales. Shall I introduce Kat now, Mark? Yes. Okay, yes. so Hello. because of COVID, I'm just going to move my chair, and uh, Kat's going to come in. This is Kat Morris, who's going to tell you about Club Ivor Bach. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello, uh, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are the headphones? Oh, the lovely set of headphones, these, although I do sound very echoey. <laughs> um, so yeah, Club, as Hugh mentioned, we're coming up to 40 years as Club of Bach. We started off um, as a sort of Welsh language social club, really, and developed over the years into a, a more of a live music venue, supporting a lot of new and emerging artists. Um, you know, we had people like The Killers and Coldplay play here before, really, before they came Coldplay and The Killers. Um, and yeah, so we now also look after Sue Festival, which who actually set up 13-ish or so years ago. Uh, we've just launched a new music label management and then um, publishing company. So a lot going on. <laughs> wow. Can you, can you throw a couple of the, those links in the chat about the label and stuff? I didn't know anything about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's literally just launched um, last week. So it's called Club Music. Oh, wow. Um, cool. I'll send that in the chat. Um, and then, so currently we have Buzzard, Buzzard, Buzzard um, and Panic Shack on the management. And um, they're two Welsh um, new bands, really, really cool. Um, have a look at them. Huh, I'm, re I'm reading the chat. That's an odd comment. We'll deal, we'll, deal, we'll deal with that later. So, but what is your job exactly? What is your well, job exactly? I'm a marketing officer. So right. um, yeah, a lot of uh, social media and that sort of thing. Yeah, and, and how many of there are you there? We're a very small team, actually. I think it's eight or nine. Yes, eight or nine of us. Wow. So not and how long have you been there? Not too long, two and a half years. Oh, wow. So okay, yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right, well, brilliant. I appreciate it. Thanks very much. And thanks for letting Hugh sit down there. Are, is there some recording going on upstairs? Is that what I heard? No. <laughs> is there some recording going on upstairs? No, no, it's literally just me and Hugh and our tech I guy in the building. I thought they were the recording building. a TV show upstairs. Oh, yeah, so the, this was this morning. Um, oh, yeah. Sky Arts are doing a series on independent venues in the UK. Um, yeah. So they were filming here earlier this morning. That's coming out sometime in June, I think. Oh, so, awesome. Yeah. All right, cool. Brilliant. Thank All right, you. Next time. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Dear cat. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Kat. And thanks. Yeah, that was brilliant. Thanks for partnership partnering with us uh, here at Club Iverbach. Very exciting. So you're ready for a little chat? Yeah, lovely. If, if no one else has got anything better to do, let's do it. No, all right. Okay, cool. So I, I, so I guess we should reveal to everyone that we've known each other for a while, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, uh, I'd have been a DJ on Radio One when I met you, uh, what, tw uh, 20 years ago, something like that, Mark, when you were a radio plugger. Yeah, and, um, a, long, a long time ago. A long time ago. I've still got CDs, like I'm sure a lot of people on this Zoom call in the attic, um, sitting there, sweating, <laughs> collecting dust. A lot of them have your stickers on, uh, the four sticker. Um, ah, yes. You just sent me amazing records by people like Jens Lechman, funnily enough, from Sweden, where you now live. Um, I remember you telling me about the darkness really early on. You were plugging them when they, you know, were trying to get their first radio plays. Um, I mean, loads of bands that you brought through as a plugger. But, but the first band was The Hives, I think. I met right. you in Cardiff the first time I ever went to Cardiff. Ah, okay. Yeah. So you knew The Hives because they were signed to Pop Tones Records, right? Correct. Exactly. So if we... Uh, and back then, which is a long time ago, like I, I'm, I, I'd like you to talk about, because I think what a lot of people are always interested in is like you had a couple of shows on Radio 1 for a long, long time. But can you sort of rewind to how you even got started? Because 
like you mentioned when we were talking last week about hospital radio, which I completely forgot about. And so like, yeah. what's your sort of origin story for lack of a better expression? Oh, okay. So um, forgive me if I've bored you with this before, but yeah, I mean, I started when I was, so when I was a teenager, I was into magic and I was into Disney cartoons. And then I started listening to the radio when I was about 14, 13, 14, and became obsessed with radio and with um, commercial radio stations and the evening session with Steve Lamack and Joe Wiley. And so through the uh, Duke of Edinburgh Award, the late Duke of Edinburgh, one of the things he set up was the Duke of Edinburgh Award where you could go and ask people, you could do voluntary work and get like a certificate at the end. So I asked if I could go to a hospital radio station. So I ended up in the UK, we had hospitals have radio stations in them. I appreciate this is a luxury. I appreciate we are a Western part of the world and I appreciate this is quite a shock because not every country has these, right, Mark? I, I, like, I don't, yeah, I don't know if they have radio. In, does any, anybody, if you have radio in your hospitals in your country, post it in the chat. Cause I, <laughs> I have no, I've, it's, it's, it's a very UK thing to me. Yeah, and it was a big thing for DJs to um, get uh, practice and to get into the, you know, basically if you were a geek about radio, hospital radio was the place to go to. Um, and it still is, it's still brilliant, doing great things. And they play artists and they, they take requests from the patients and it's a real community, you know, it's a real community spirited thing. So um, that's how I started. And then, I mean, I managed bands. Um, I would write reviews for local fanzines. Um, I would, you know, the usual uh, re re review radio, uh, review songs on the radio. I'd answer phones for the local BBC radio station and all of that. And I met a producer called Bethan Elvin then when I was uh, 17 at a few gigs, a Gorky Psychotic Monkey gig in a venue called the Coal Exchange, in fact, down in Cardiff Bay, where the first ever million pound check was written because Cardiff is a big coal, was, was a big coal exporter. Um, so I met her and she knew that Radio One, the BBC funded Radio One station, was looking to set up a new show specifically for Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland um, on, on the BBC. Was that The Nations? Was that the third Yeah, it was called The Nations. So at the time, Steve Lamack would present it, then Zane Lowe would go on to present it. And for two hours on a Thursday, Zane Lowe would broadcast across England, um, Wales would have us, and then Scotland, Northern Ireland would have their own shows as well. Um, and, you know, there was a big budget. Devolution was a big thing as well. So Wales became devolved uh, politically from the UK government around 1999, and this was kind of happening at the same time. So the BBC thought, OK, things are changing, so we need to reflect that in the output of the, uh, of the shows. And then, you know, over the years then, things or well, budgets were cut, BBC budgets have had to be cut um and the landscapes change you know fm you know dab wasn't a thing digital radio wasn't a thing in 99 into the 2000s when we started so you know when you look at the uk and the british isles like you know you've got um uh you know a, a lot of it is a lot our main ma media is the bbc um there is a Radio Wales, there's a Radio Cymru broadcasting in the Welsh language as well, there's a Radio Scotland, but also across the UK, you've got all these local radio stations. So if you live in Derby or Nottingham or Northampton or Sheffield, there is a BBC radio station dedicated just to your patch, to your area as well. So um, it's a huge, it's a huge thing. And so that Nation show, was that, was the goal of that to highlight Welsh bands mostly or yeah. so what so you started so you started playing mostly Welsh stuff I can't remember it's a long time ago so yeah, it was a mix we'd play uh, Welsh artists Welsh bands and when I say Welsh by the way moving on I mean bands from Wales yeah it's important to differentiate between that and Welsh language artists yeah. as well you know Welsh bands Welsh music was is for me music from Wales um alongside the Arctic Monkeys and 
uh, Simeon Mobile Disco or whoever was, you know, was relevant at the time. But what we wanted to do was portray Welsh life on the BBC and on, on Radio 1. And then we'd occasionally take those shows to stand in for Steve Lamack or Zane Lowe um, and exciting things like that. We'd be on just before John Peel, so there'd be a bit of a crossover there occasionally, which was wonderful, of course, because he'd support a lot of the artists that we were playing as well. Um, and then, you know, venues like this in Club Iver Bach, we'd, we'd come here, we'd do live shows, we'd go across Wales with an OB truck, and we'd put on MCs and DJ nights, and we'd fit, uh, record it all and take it to air. So that's how, how we started. But that was, yeah, as I say, that was a, a long, that was 22 years ago. And then since then, I've gone on to do uh, daytime shows. So I was on Saturday, Sunday afternoon for a long time playing pop hits alongside new artists. And the difference between a nighttime show where you get to play two hours of what you want uh, on Radio 1, as opposed to a daytime show where you got to pick three records, you know, you got to pick one, one an hour. Um, so you'd have to make them count then. Yeah. So, so let's just explain that to people because I think that's a question that comes up a lot. So if you, if you have a show in the evenings, you get to play more what you want, right? But then... Yeah, but I mean, uh, traditionally, but of course, as more and more radio is set up, community radio stations, uh, student, student stations and stations like Six Music, you know, those nighttime shows can be on in the daytime. And with Listen Again, if you want to listen to a show that's broadcast at 4 a.m. at midday, then you can. So I think those lines have blurred a bit. Into, well, they've blurred a lot in terms of, you know, what's daytime and what's nighttime. I think more niche and more specialist radio is, is the way forward, and it's what people want. Yeah, but, but tr traditionally the way it would be, would, would it be that sometime in the daytime, the DJ hasn't actually picked most of those tracks they're picked by more of a committee is that right yeah the playlists on stations usually well on you know on radio when they stop at like 6 p.m when annie max starts her show and then the nighttime shows are all handpicked by the djs with the producers helping out as well um so yeah that's traditionally what used to happen okay and so so you're doing this show you were doing this show in wales like and you'd go in and you'd have to fill a couple hours with music. How did you do that? Like, you know, it's, yeah. you don't just make it up on the fly, do you? Yeah. Or like, how, how did you figure out what to play? Well, back then um, it was a mix of, um, it was never done on the fly. And it was, yeah, I've never done that. Never done a radio show. But I mean, where it's just like, hey, fancy a bit of this? It's always, pre-planned i mean occasionally there'll be the, the odds oh actually there's a request come in or this record actually is making us think of this record so can you drop that in but um normally there's pre-planning a lot of pre-planning going into things um and back then it was a mix of pluggers sending us records uh, and then over the years that changed to people just sending in music i mean i know you said in your opening talk mark that you know, people don't send CDs in jiffy bags anymore. They cut, they still do, you know, believe it or not, in 2021, it still happens. And it's, you know, people still give people memory sticks or a CDR of things in gigs when gigs happened um, or at conferences or whatever. And it's, I mean, personally, I prefer things online. Uh, I, I think it's easier to manage. I think it's easier for everybody. It keeps costs down. It's greener, all of that. Um, and it's obviously the way forward, but um, yeah, I mean, and then over the years, I mean, introducing was a big part of what I did at Radio One as well, BBC introducing. Well, let's explain that a bit because there's a lot of people who aren't on the call from the UK. Sure, yeah. And because that, like BBC Radio, it's publicly funded. It's like the CBC in Canada or maybe PBS in the or, or what NPR in the US. But explain what introducing was and why it actually existed. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, the BBC's got a lot of stations across the UK dotted around um, and a lot of shows, therefore, supporting new music. And I think instead of them all being islands and kind of kind of standalone islands of 
supporting new music, the BBC thought it'd be a good way to bring these together so that they'd be more um, synchronicity and that music would have more of an impact. So if a show in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, uh, would hear something amazing, they could pass it forward easier to Radio 1 so they could get play on a daytime show and so on. And so the introducing shows, um, there's a website, a free to use website where people can upload their music regardless of genre, um, from classical and jazz to grime and rap and indie and rock or whatever, all the genres covered. Uh, there's no rules in terms of that. You get to upload, I think it's three tracks and then shows, you can tick a box saying where you're based, always relevant to you uh, geographically uh, or the shows that you think might like your music. So um, the, that's a good way of artists kind of con contacting local radio stations uh, and DJs to get the support that they need early on. And it's worked really well. The stage, the stage goes to Glastonbury um, and Reading, and it did go to Tea in the Park. And so it has a big presence. And it's, it's, it's across the BBC, really. I think the BBC, like lots of big media organisations over the last couple of years and more, have had to make more of an impact with less money and think about things, about how to make things more um, more dramatic and more interesting to capture people's imagination and have more of an impact. And it, it and therefore benefits the artists that it's playing. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting one. And But as you mentioned, BBC is publicly funded in the UK as well. So there's a budget there to, to make this happen. So, let, and so we're back, back to Cardiff you're you're getting sent records by people like me that's how we met radio but, pluggers yeah yeah exactly so th these people are paid to try to convince you to play records and we could talk about that in a bit but like you're not just sitting there waiting for things to hit your desk what are you like what are you what are you doing to find records because do you just rely on on what other people tell you or do you decide for yourself or how does that mix happen? Yeah, well, I think naturally, um, like I'm sure everybody on this call this evening, we all find music in so many different ways and we haven't got just one route. And so, you know, I was very aware when I joined the BBC um, about like impartiality and, you know, you've got to have that kind of get up and go to find things yourself. So. I mean, where do I find music? I suppose it's the title of the session, isn't it? How we listen. Um, so, I mean, record shops have always been an important part of um, my musical discovery. Um, sometimes going in, hearing something, buying it and falling in love with it, like an artist called uh, Marissa Anderson, who I'm a big fan of. And I heard had been played in the Honest John's record shop once in London and thought literally what's this, bought it and have been a fan of hers ever since and continue to play her on the radio. Um, so, but also like online. So I check out what Spillers Records are selling in Cardiff, what Drift Records are selling in Totnes, Piccadilly Records in Manchester, um, uh, the Rough Trade shops, of course, although they've got so much, often it's the smaller batches and the smaller uh, shops who have more time to, recommend two or three things rather than 20 or 30 things um so yeah shops are really important you know listing magazines back when gigs were a thing uh the, you know the the who's been booked to play where who's playing festival bills lower down so i'd check out andy's focus wales i'd check out end of the road and green man and latitude festival and also through latitude i'd book a stage as well the lake stage at the latitude festival for 10 years and so i became a sort of uh well i promote a gig in london as well once a month at the social venue just off oxford street and that was a free gig three four bands every month so i would talk to agents then uh, in terms of finding music for that and that then fed into my radio shows as well so often I'd hear about bands from the agents earlier than from the radio people if there was a radio person or the record company so it was a good way of keeping um, my uh, my well she is to the ground 
in terms of keeping busy. I've always liked keeping busy, basically. I've always enjoyed finding things and hearing bits and bobs. And the other place I've always enjoyed, uh, you know, finding stuff is other people's radio shows as well. And it sounds obvious, but when people ask me, how do I get into radio? The first thing I do, I, well, f- first thing I ask is what radio shows do you, li- you know, do you listen to the radio, you know? Um, and are you making it already? Are you making radio yourself? Because there's, especially now, you've got to, there's no excuse not to be doing that, I don't think. But yeah, I listen to a lot of inc- incredible radio shows like Giles Peterson on Six Music or Tom Ravenscroft. Adam Walton on Radio Wales. Um, and yeah, and, and there's loads of great community stations as well um, in the UK, like Worldwide FM uh, is one that does incredible things. NTS is massive as well. Um, and so I find bits and bobs through there, like a musical squirrel, if you like, Mark. Like, but, but I, so one thing I'm curious about, like, because we had that question, I don't know if you heard about about um, gigs. So, someone someone was talking about. They asked when I was talking about pay to play. How you know is it bad that if you go to uh, if you go to a, if you play a gig and there's no one there? But then before this call started, you were saying, oh, like I've been at club tons I've, of times when yeah. no one is there. I so mean, this it, is the venue now. This is the venue. See, there's only the sound guy. There's cat again. And yeah, I mean, you know, it's great to be in here. I wanted, last time I was in here before the lockdown was to see Georgia playing and it was sold out and I was stood at the back over there. And, you know, I've seen, I was here for that Coldplay gig and I've seen the Strokes here and I've seen Giles Peterson and Ozzy Matley and people here. But yeah, that pay to play thing, it's, I think it's terrible. I think it's awful. I think if promoters want you to play, they want you to play. And it's on, you know, you do, nobody should pay to play for a gig, I don't think. Having said that, I'm aware that sometimes you have to pay petrol and you have to pay costs and you have to do things like that. Um, and, you know, that's not fair either. But my night at the social in London, I'd get a meagre budget every year, uh, every month, sorry, and split it three ways between bands. So I never made a penny off that night in 13 years um the bands just about covered their costs um some would sell merch some didn't have any to sell or whatnot and would carry on so you know the the venue would make money off the bar uh, which is how it kind of made its money and that that was the business plan you know um i didn't want to make money off it and it's the same with soon festival in cardiff as well we set that that festival up 10 years ago um and lost loads of personal money in setting it up. I, rem- you know. I remember that period, actually. Yes. Well, there you go, yeah. yeah. Uh, and never never made a penny, but it still exists. And now it's run by Club Iver Bach, which is great, this venue. So I think, you know, I mean, we've had, you know, you've heard of bands turning up to venues and the promoter saying to them, how many people are you expecting to come and see you tonight? And that's not the band's job if you rock up in a city that you haven't been to before. It's That's the promoter's job, surely. The, but now, but in your in your role though, like, do you do you feel you need to go to every gig and have it be packed to be impressed? What if what if I turned up to a gig to see a band do and I there was no gig? one there? What, what, do you think? Oh God, no one cares. I'm going home or what? Oh my God, no. I saw. I mean, I went to see a rapper called Flo Hio playing. Granted, it was at Glastonbury Festival, so you know there was already two hundred thousand people there. But when I went to see her play in, there was about, well, there's me and my wife and there was about 10 other people there and she was incredible and it was amazing and I loved her. It didn't matter that there was only 10 of us there in a huge tent skanking away. Um, so no, it, does, it, it doesn't matter because, you know, I think it only matters when, um, when, when big companies need a hit and they need an impact and they want to know how many social media followers you have. Luckily, thanks to the BBC and, you know, I'm not, you know, I am an employee of the BBC, but, you know, I'm not a manager there or anything, but we can take risks and we can support artists who might not have any followers on social media and who might not have been in a proper studio or whatever. Um, 
that's the beauty of public service broadcasting, I suppose, isn't it? And so, but when you go to a gig and there's no one there, how, and, and you decide, oh, there's something in this band. Tell me a bit more because I think, again, oh, this comes. I, I wish, I wish, what? Do you want to know why I like music? No, no, no. I was, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was meaning like, you go to these gigs and you think there's something in, in the band, right? Like you think there's something to it. And yeah. h- how do you, what do you do after that? Like you play it on your show, but how, oh, how yeah. what is that journey? Artists are always curious about well, what's that journey where I'm playing these gigs, no one's there, but someone mm. like Hugh Stevens or Steve Lamack or Annie Mack came to my gig. Like, how do you, like, do you talk to all, all the other DJs or do you like, because there's lots of yeah. stuff that sort of happens naturally and no one seems to, it's always very hard to put your finger on what it is. It's very hard to put your finger on ooh, how people make it in the music uh, biz because um, as you mentioned earlier on, there's no straight line and it's about, it's about is the art, do the artist, do they love making the music that they love? And that's got to be the main priority and that's got to be, I think people can hear it if they don't or not. I suppose when I listen to music, I, I listen to things that sound comfortable and things that sound comfortable in their own skin. So regardless of genre, does it sound confident? And I don't mean swaggering confidence. I mean, just confident in its own skin. And in terms of um, radio play, you know, people say, well, you know, what, what artists are you most proud of playing early on who've gone on to big things? And of course there's loads, but radio play for me is just like part of that jigsaw. And this fits in with your graph that you were showing earlier on as well. It's part of the jigsaw. So um, people would sometimes get one play on a radio show and a radio station and expect things to kick off. And often they wouldn't because, <laughs> you know, God knows who was listening and, you know, people are busy. Um, so it's, it's, for me, it's part of a big jigsaw and it's a part of, it's a part of a, com- you've got to be part of a community, I think, as well. You've got to, you know, if nobody's coming to your gigs locally, why would you expect people to come to your gigs in other parts of the country where you live or what, or whatever? Um, do you know what I mean? I think it has to start local. I think you have to have your champions and your supporters locally for things to blossom elsewhere. Because I like, I think that's interesting because I we did a, like a how we listen like a panel in Canada um, with Breakout this organization called Breakout West and they're on the call today and and it was with these um, these two sisters who are rappers from Calgary in Canada and they really talked about the community word and it comes up a lot but like can you explain what community means to you because it aren't like we're on the internet, like, because it, it, no. it, has it changed from 20 years ago where you knew your community was people maybe in the area you lived in? Like, how do you see that? Yeah, I think it probably has changed a bit because I guess what I mean by community is it don't have to be local to you either. They can be like-minded music fans who run a similar club night or venue night in another part of the world. Um, but if they like what you do and you like what they do, then that's your community. I suppose that's what I mean. But I also do mean local. I do mean, you know, working with your local venues and working with um, your local radios, your local shops, uh, your local, um, it doesn't have to be music shops, you know, just local creative scene. Um, Because I think, you know, there's unity and strength there as well. So I think whilst it's easier to make music and it's, you know, it is still hard to get noticed and to make an impact, but if you can start things local, um, I think it's kind of like in your mind local, isn't it? Is what we, is, uh, yeah. So yeah, I I do, it's difficult one to pin down, but um, that's where it begins, I think. But is is it something like you mentioned all these things that you sort of, possibly look for or notice when you hear new music do, do you do you see that sense of community as being a part of it that you like yeah say I think for so. example yeah. b- 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 band, bands in cardiff like you you maybe have been out of town or something or you keep hearing about a certain band you've never seen through certain people like 
Is is that what you mean that people exchange information by word of mouth or? Yeah, I mean, that happens and that's a natural thing to do. And if something's amazing, you'll hear about it, I do believe, locally um, and uh, in your community, whether that be online or uh, if something stands out, if something's incredible, people want to share it and people want you to come to the gig and people want to put gigs on and want festivals to book you and whatnot. So, you know, we found that in Wales. So, so I mean, take, for example, a record like Boy Azuga, a band like Boy Azuga a few years back. Um, they'd been in various bands and they'd been session musicians and, you know, everybody was talking about suddenly Davey and Boy Azuga's record signed to Heavenly Records um, and, you know, playing every festival, playing every gig in, in Wales because they were fantastic. And it was that step up on the side of the venue that we're in now in Club Iberbach, there's a massive mural of Gweno, who um, is a Cardiff based artist. Um, and Gweno sings in Welsh and Cornish. Like she was brought up speaking both languages in Cardiff. And um, she self-released the record through Pesky Records. And then Heavenly Records picked up on it and have taken her around the world to lots of music collectors' fa uh, collections. So um, there's... And was she, all, so, sorry to interrupt, was she also, in, she was previously in a band before, is that not correct? She, like, yeah, back in the day she was in the Pipettes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then, but you know, that was a long, a, a while ago. Um, she started making this kind of dystopian sci-fi influenced music um, in the Welsh language. Um, Who would have thunk that that would end up on Jules Holland and that Gweno would tour with uh, Manic Street Preachers or Ben Howard and play North America and all these incredible showcases around the world. But of course, she was confident and she had, um, she had in impeccable taste and she knew what she was doing. She had a vision for the record and for how it sounded. Um, she's an incredible performer. And so it worked. And that's, that's interesting as well, because I speak Welsh and English. I do two shows in the Welsh language on the BBC once every week as well. So to see bands, um, like obviously Super Furry Animals did it back in the day. They took um, an album called Mung, which they recorded in Welsh, into the top 20 um, in the album charts, which is um, kind of unheard of these days. Uh, and to see them doing well back in the day, and then more recently, people like Nine Bach, who have won Radio 2 Folk Awards um, and have toured Australia and played in Canada a bit, I think. And um, they sing only in Welsh as well. So it proves that music has no borders. It proves that people are open-minded and that people do like quality music, regardless of language uh, that it's sung in or whatever. Um, and yeah, it's an interesting one. I, I'm actually quite curious about that. So living in, living in Sweden, there are a lot of bands that I, I, I quite like that, that sing in Swedish. And I'm always, and it's, it's the same in Canada where you have a, a large French population and they, and, and a, so a lot of artists sing in French as well. And, and I'm always, from your experience or, or what's been your experience with with, with that, that do, do a lot of artists feel a pressure to sing? Because I think what, sort of what I was talking about at the start is a lot of artists feel pressure to do certain things. So do you feel artists feel pressure to not sing in Welsh? Because they <laughs> uh, feel that, or the reverse, or maybe it's the reverse that they feel, or do you think it comes up? Uh, thankfully, I don't think there is a pressure there now at all. Either way, I think it's, um, it's purely a personal choice for the artists so you know if I think if you can sing in a language then you tend to want to do it I think is what I found so if you can't speak Welsh then you're not going to and that's fair enough obviously yeah um, but I think a, a lot of artists feel ownership over the Welsh language music scene so they feel that they're part of it and they want to contribute and they want to creatively express themselves in a language that they can talk. So yeah, there's no, it's, there's no pressure, I don't think, um, only from, from, from them, themselves, I think. Huh. Um, and then let's talk again, going back to say, I think when we were talking last, you, you, you were saying that the, when was the last time there was a band, a Welsh band on the playlist at Radio One? Oh gosh! Well, I mean, in terms of bands from Wales, man, yes, it's probably. 
I guess I think high contrast might have been the uh, last Welsh artist who is a drum and bass DJ based in uh, just outside Cardiff and yeah, was on hospital records for a long time. Um, I mean, it's tricky. I think in the UK, London still is the centre of the music industry. Um, I think things are easier there if you're an artist who uh, wants to play a more um, um, major label game. I think it's definitely the place to be. Um, and I, but at the same time, I think creativity is everywhere and talent is everywhere. So I don't, you know, I've always been an advocate of not moving to London and staying there. I've always been a fan of people doing things locally and, you know, you can, everybody can travel to London if they want to. So, um, yeah, so it's, uh, I, I think COVID has changed things in terms of things like this um, and in terms of conferences and in terms of people collaborating. I've heard more artists in Wales collaborating over the past year than ever before just because they weren't afraid to DM somebody and to send them a little Instagram message going, you know, do you want to sing on my beat or whatever? And that's a fantastic thing, I think. I think people are always scared of, you know, who's in charge of this, who are the gatekeepers and horrible things like this. And, um, and who do I, you know, who do I contact to make it all my dreams come true? Whereas actually you just reach out and you just talk to people and there's always somebody at the end of a phone or at the end of an email who will either ignore you and will never answer your email or might well answer your email and say, actually, yeah. I like your music. But if they don't answer, they probably don't like it. And you have to crack on with it then, don't you? Yeah. So I'm going to just say, if anybody's got any questions for Hugh, why don't you start throwing them in the chat? Yeah, it's 20 past six now, everyone. Is it's nearly bedtime. <laughs> but the, uh, but I, I did want to, I did want to bring, you mentioned the gatekeeper thing and you did mention the email thing. Like I'm always telling people that they, they should go ahead and so, oh, well, here we go. How will we pitch music to you, Hugh? Because this is the question that oh, I yeah. don't, it, like, how does it work from being in your position? Um, well, uh, yes, yeah, well, technically, Rob, um, through introducing is, is a good way of pitching to um, the people. If you want to pitch to me, it's probably best to send a DM on Instagram or Twitter at the moment, just because I've been having issues with uh, an old, uh, uh, email so yeah that's probably the best way it's 10 30 a.m in bc canada oh cool bye ellie don't go ellie ellie don't go uh oh look this is a good one from connie i've just started presenting on my university's radio every week what are some tips you could give me for making an engaging and good radio show connie um i would say rip up the rule book um listen to loads of other radio stations nick the best ideas from other djs and tweak them and practice them until you hear your own voice would be my advice um, and have fun with it because fun is contagious. Uh, it sounds cheesy, but it is. Um, uh, that would be my advice, Mark. Um, we've got another one here because this comes up a lot again. What, what about social stats and Spotify plays? Do people say, hey, Hugh, this record's great. They've got X amount of Twitter followers. Do you think, do, does that mean anything to you? No. No, it doesn't for me personally, but of course, when I present radio shows, they tend to be specialist radio shows and I have the luxury of playing them. I guess when you're moving on to a playlist at a station or something, I think those things might matter, actually. I think people might say that they don't, but I think they probably do. Um, having said that, I think everybody in the music industry likes to think of themselves as somebody apart from the music industry and likes to think they're like a little bit different to everybody else. And actually, hey, I'm the music guy. I'm the music lady in this part of the world. Uh, so um, I think people do like trusting their own ears and people do like taking a gamble. And people like finding things that um, other people haven't heard of. People do like that. Magazines like it. Uh, radio shows love it. Um, as long as it sounds great to the person that's going to play it at the end. So, I, you know, I wouldn't worry about stats unless you love Instagramming. If you love doing Insta stories, if you love tweeting, and if you love sharing your life, then 
obviously crack on. But if it's not comfortable, <laughs> then you really shouldn't worry about it. Now, I've, uh, we haven't talked too much about pluggers, but we've just had a couple questions. One from um, Olive, one from Liz. So Liz says, does working with a radio press plugger, so PRs or radio pluggers, help getting a band played? It does. You and, you know, the good ones are great and the bad ones will take your money and promise you the world. So it's about trust, isn't it? It's about to what you were saying earlier in your opening statement, Mark. Does it feel right in your gut doing, giving somebody money to work on your thing? If it doesn't, then don't do it. Um, a lot of good ones will do things because they love it and will want to do stuff for free at the beginning to help out. Um, a lot of ones will just want to check and will tell you that they will get played on these places and sent to these people. But a lot of this work can be done, I think, by the artists themselves if they do a little bit of homework in terms of listening to shows. Is the music relevant? Um, does you know the local DJ go to their shows or what and, and whatnot and whatever? So it's um, it's complex, and there's some great press and radio people out there who um, will do a really good job. But I think normally you can tell if they and, are into it or not. And 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 I would agree with you. There's lots of great people that and we you know we met through me doing that job, and we're still friends today. But it, w w is there anything that if you had to put your finger on it? that you need to be watching out for? Because I know that a lot of artists struggle with this, that they're not, they're never sure what they should do if they should. Are there things? Well, like I think anybody p promising plays on any, on anywhere is risky because you can't do that. You can't promise plays on any shows. You can't say, oh, so-and-so is going to love this and they'll, I'll get them to play it if you pay me 500 bucks. It's um, surely it's better to be, surely it's better for everybody, the radio plugger and the artist that everyone's on the same page and we'll see what happens you know we'll take it from here and we'll see where we can get with this rather than specifics um but it's it's a tricky one because there's you know djs are just humans at the end of the day and they want to play stuff that they like and i know for example there's some djs on six music who love um being you know uh, who love a handwritten a little note, something relevant to the show, something that proves that the artist listens. Um, when you think about something like Steve Lamack going to see idols playing in Bristol and bumping into them in a pub, that was the first time he met them, I think. Um, and, you know, just getting on and then, then becoming his favourite band and idols becoming one of the biggest bands in the UK. You know, that happens on a trust basis and on a friendship basis. Um, and I know it's hard to make those magic moments happen, but you can't make those magic moments happen because they're magic moments. I, I think I, I think I think that says a lot. That it's exactly how I feel for sure. So uh, Rosanna in Car at Cardiff Uni, here's one. I'm interested to know if there are any gigs in and around Cardiff that Hugh is looking forward to. No, nope, absolutely. <laughs> well, no, no. Yeah, there's loads. Any there's gig. No any well, gig. yeah. I mean, I know uh, there's loads in the diary, um, and. I can't wait for gigs to come back and I can't wait for venues like this one, Club Bach and festivals like Focus Wales and so on. And around the world, the venues are all in the same situation and um, I can't wait for everything to reopen. And um, I hope they will be when it's safe and sensible to do so, you know, but yeah, it's, it's tough. Okay, well, let's take one last question. Do you have any special considerations when programming international artists compared to UK based artists? And well, we could a, even we could yeah. even take that when we talk about um, uh, Welsh and other international, like in combination. Sure, that's an interesting one. Thank you, Andrea, for the question. Um, international artists. Um, well, first of all, what, what, does, she, does Andrea mean playing them on the radio? Um, if so, um, I, I'll be honest. It's always exciting when an international artist sends you something to play on the radio. Um, because it's the unknown, isn't it? It's different and it's, you know, it's who it's Hjeltelin from Iceland or it's who Casio kids from Norway or whatever. Uh, it's always, that was 10 years ago, I know, but it's exciting. <laughs> um, and so, no, I mean, I think um, singing, 
because I'm a Welsh speaker, I think I'm always more open to um, lang native languages being sung. It doesn't have to be in English. Um, I loved when I was in M for Montreal many years ago, seeing Ibey playing before, before they signed to XL Records. And they just absolutely blew me away, played them on the radio and so on. So I think making music that, you know, if, if there's an audience out there for everybody, I think. And if you make music that's super hyper local or, you know, um, traditional to your part of the world, there'll be an audience for that at some point because we've never heard it before. And I think that's the true, true for a lot of Welsh artists as well. You know, a lot of the world hasn't heard the Welsh language, but Nine Bach, for example, want to sing in Welsh and take that music elsewhere. And people are interested in our history and our culture in the same way I'm interested in other people's history and culture. Um, and when I say history and culture, that could be a punk band from LA, you know? Like, I'm interested in that because we don't have as many punk bands doing what a lot of the LA punk bands do over here. It's the same with rap music from Canada. Um, you know, it's, it, there's a different sound to it. And so being that, it's back to that confidence thing and being that confident and uh, making music that you really want to make and love making, that, that says it all, I think, because it, 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 people understand and can hear the, the, the quality in it straight away. Thanks for all your questions. Casio kids were fantastic, says Neil. Yeah, they were. School, school Pada are interesting. Thank you, Neil. Swedish band. Do you know them, Mark? No. School Pada. Swedish bands. Let me Google. Is but I, I, think, I, I think that last comment is just a perfect way to end, really. Because... Okay, bye. I, <laughs> oh, sorry. No. Hey, thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for we yeah. need we need we need a wind we need to wind down with you. But I, I just think I just think that says it all because I think so many people have an expectation that there's gonna be a simple solution that if you do this or that. And I think they a lot of the time people forget that it's people that just people like music. And if the music's good and they feel something from it. So I'm I feel encouraged to hear you say that after all this time. That Excellent. you still feel the same way but oh here we go oh and if anybody has music to send maybe they could send it through bitter maybe through uh, jamie at bitter maybe jamie could forward it stuff to me if you've got links or anything like liz wants to manage uh, sends me something that she's managing a punk rap thing would that be all right for a bit sure, yeah yeah maybe Should for a 24 hour window jamie i don't want to employ oh. you as my person with me no problem i can't afford to pay you as a pa i haven't got i haven't got the cash but maybe for a 24 hour window or something, or if anybody's got any questions or anything like that. Oh my God. Great. What Thank have you. you done to Jamie? You're gonna blow up his email if you. <laughs> nice one, everyone. And thanks for all your time. Uh, thanks for everyone's time and for having me, Mark. It was brilliant. Bitter. Thanks so much. This and was thanks awesome. to Club Bach and Focus Wales for partnering. Oh yeah. And Kat and Andy for speaking. Yeah, man. And everybody, thanks so much everybody for all the questions. It was brilliant. Have a good night and keep the faith. There you go. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much, it was brilliant.